Out of the ash I rise with my red hair and I eat men like air. This subject is extensive, to say the very least. It's one close to my heart as a daughter of a ginger mother. The subject holds so much, in fact, that the video will be split into two parts. The nature of the ginger gene being recessive means that redheads are by science more rare and therefore innately quote-unquote special for not being the norm. Whether that means that they are a sight to be bullied, fetishized, or in some cases burned at the stake, the rarity of ginger hair has been the cause for serious attention. The primal association of the colour red conjures fire and blood, the latter in women of course inciting thoughts of periods and thus fertility. Safe to say that red hair in women is one of the many characteristics that has been the cause of their further marginalisation throughout history. Though it can be most associated with whiteness today, red hair does not always adorn white women with freckles and heritage originating from the British Isles. There are various ancient representations of red-haired peoples, but author Jackie Collis Harvey, writer of Red, A History of the Redhead, speaks of the supposed first time they were identified as a race or identity of their own. The Thracians were a people who originated from a multitude of places, mainly around the area where Asia and Europe meet today. They were often described as having blue eyes and ginger hair and were often depicted on Greek pots, which were of course orange and black. It is not uncommon for Thracian women to be depicted fighting with weapons in their hands and tattoos on their bodies, just like the men of their people. It is said they wore fox skins on their heads and had untrustworthy and violent characteristics. Thus, the fox becomes sly, the red-headed woman becomes daring. In stature she was very tall, in appearance most terrifying, in the glance of her eye most fierce, and her voice was harsh. A great mass of the tawniest hair fell to her hips. Around her neck was a large golden necklace, and she wore a tunic of diverse colours, over which a thick mantle was fastened with a brooch. It has to be said, there isn't really a definitive painted description of the warrior Boudicca, or Bodicea. Merely the myth itself is what holds the power. And arguably, she is one of the most famous red-headed women of history, let alone the ancient world. Her hair was hip-length, flowing flaxen, as we see her pictured almost always riding a chariot or in battle. Thomas Thornycroft's sculpture, though not visually depicting to us her golden locks, depicts the fearless Boudicca leading her daughters into battle. The larger-than-life sculpture sits pride of place in London's Westminster, depicting Boudicca's quest for the rebellion against the Romans, after the death of her husband, the rape of her two daughters, and her own public flogging by the Romans. Ultimately, she was to meet her demise. But she is known in history as a figure of female empowerment, seen here with her two daughters, exemplifying what she has become known for. The horses are rearing so as to whip up more drama to the piece, as well as fortify the impression of strength of the leader of the Iceni tribe, Boudicca. Her outstretched arms duly reconfirm her willingness to overcome that which is headed for her and give even greater height to this figure of prowess, whose sculpture sits atop a plinth. Now we turn to Lilith, the evil redhead, originating from ancient Babylonian religion and Mesopotamia. It is said that Lilith was modelled after Lilu, these perverse human slayer demons, hungry because they embodied the spirits of dead children. Lilith has been depicted as a killer of infants in their sleep, sometimes even in a pregnant woman's womb. She is mainly, however, known for her sexual deviance, being a grand seductress of men. She has been depicted to cause impotence in men. In early Islam, she gives birth to demons in hell. She is mentioned in the Bible too, only once, but generally early Christian belief is that she was Adam's first wife. After being raped by Adam, she protested and fled, and can now be found in waste places and in the howling moan of the wind. In Jewish culture, some families hang a mobile or charm above a baby's cot, 
in order to distract Lilith from harming the baby. There's a theory that the word lullaby is derived from the Hebrew Lilith Abai, which translates to Lilith be gone. Lilith's earliest appearance in the literature of the Romantic period was in Goethe's work Faust. Who's that there? Take a good look. Who is that? Adam's wife, his first, beware of her. Her beauty's one boast is her dangerous hair. When Lilith winds it tight around young men, she doesn't soon let go of them again. Here Goethe alludes to the stories of Lilith that depict her with killer hair. Like a sort of giant squid, she tendrils her hair around the necks of her victims and strangles them to their death. It's for this reason that she is commonly associated with the snake. While Lilith is not always depicted as a redhead, she often adorns red in the underworld and is generally seen as the first ever vampire. Coming into the Middle Ages, we can briefly look at Lady Godiva as another sexualized woman with red hair. Godiva was a noble woman of the Anglo-Saxon period who became known for having ridden through the streets of Coventry naked. As a condition set by her husband in order for him to agree to her pleas of lowering the taxes for the suffering people of their town. She implored the people of Coventry to remain inside with closed windows so as to protect her modesty while she made her journey. All complied other than one man called Thomas. Hence we here have the etymology of the peeping Tom. It's debated as to whether her hair was blonde or red, but it was certainly fair and is more popularly depicted as red to mark a starker contrast with the white horse atop she sat. Lady Godiva isn't looked on as demeaned, sexualized yes, but there is a sense that she has power here. She overcame her husband's absurd suggestion by following through with the bet for the benefit of the wider society over which she ruled. Safe to say her sainthood has transcended the centuries and into today, perhaps more crassly than prior, with all the titillations that Godiva as a figure implies. There is a masturbatory element to her bareback riding, which of course is now a common colloquialism for something else. Mary Magdalene is another biblical figure who was very widely depicted during the Renaissance. She is usually depicted with hair of a reddish blonde and in some cases with body hair adorning her whole body all over, which highlights her as an eroticized figure. Having been conflated with Mary of Bethany, a former prostitute since reformed, Magdalene's depiction as an overtly pious woman remained throughout popular culture. She is usually included in images of Christ's condemnation or punishment as the weeping figure, a sort of exaggeration which contributed to the depiction of women as over-emotional. There's a sensuality to the rawness of her ardour, as if the speculation to her previous life as a prostitute is confirmed in her repentance. In this work by Albert Cornelis, Magdalene appears composed, yet her dress is see-through and her breast exposed. And in Mazzuoli's The Penitent Magdalene, here she is seen clutching her hair as if it were a handkerchief, soaking up her tears at the despair of Jesus' fate. Her hair is a part of her as an image, and yet also plays into her own narrative. Elizabeth I, the Virgin Queen, Gloriana. England's first queen devoted herself to her country, choosing never to marry, nor even entertain the idea of a spouse. Throughout these portraits, her red hair and pale complexion complement each other. As we flick through the following portraits chronologically, as I go into Elizabeth I's methods of rule, see if you can notice a change in her face at all. Arguably, the Queen's choice not to marry was a political ploy, so as to never dilute her power as the women at the top. But this also meant men absolutely adored her as the sight they could never reach, even on top of her status as the Queen. Her red hair was a huge part of her identity. She chose red wigs throughout the entirety of her life. It's even rumoured that she painted the tails of her horses to match. Queen Elizabeth, unlike some of the redheads we have looked at, was not perceived as sexually deviant. But equally, the attention paid to her virginity once again marks her as a figure of sexual desire. Her body is in a way paradoxically sexualized via her advertised purity. 
Nearing the end of Elizabeth, the first segment in this video, did you notice a change in her facial makeup? But Elizabeth, being the woman in charge, made sure that her portraits were unreflective of her age. Given she reigned until she was 69, there is a suspicious sparseness of ageing in her appearance. Her red-haired wigs aided this greatly. For the last subject in the pre-modern era, let's look at witches. Akin to the character of Lilith, witch hunting in the real world posed a concrete threat to women throughout history. In the UK at least, the practice of accusing and consequentially condemning any person for their supposed ties with the occult became officially illegal in 1735. The Malaeus Maleficarum, published in 1486, was one of the most popular books of witch hunting literature. Among plenty of erroneous tales of women, who more often than not were simply just elderly and unmarried, are stories of red-headed women with green eyes as prime suspects to be witches. Though, to be fair, we can say that witches tended to be simply women that one or more people had taken a dislike to, and could really have had any colour of hair. Again, the witch is an erotic character. Women who can trick you and cast you under their spell. Witch hunting today casts a huge patriarchal shadow on the history of the subjugation of women. Witches pose a threat to men, as they have the potential to overpower the dominant sex. As mentioned at the beginning of this video, this is a dense subject, and a first for this channel, so do let me know if you enjoy it. We have discussed that hair as an extension of the body as a site of desire. Loose hair equals loose morals, especially in this pre-modern and therefore rather religious society. Equally, with the rarity of the ginger gene, pre-modern science associated redheads with some kind of mutation, spawns of the devil as some devout religious characters like to call it. Exploring a period pre-women's liberation, we can absolutely argue that the associated conceptions of these female figures have been told by male historians. Whether it's Tacitus's description of Boudicca or Faust's reimaginings of Lilith, the male gaze shaped the allure of the redhead during this period. Also do note that this is a very English take on things, and brief at that. Do watch the second part of this video on the red-headed women from the modern period to today. Mm -hmm.